Good afternoon, everybody, from the Johnson Space Center here in Houston, Texas. I'm NASA's Josh Byerly. We're going to be taking a look today at a spacewalk that is planned for November 1st, where Sonny Williams and Aki Hoshide will step outside to the P6 radiator and uh, correct an ammonia leak that has been uh, spotted out there on the very end of the station's truss structure. Here to give us more details about all this activity is the International Space Station Program Manager, Mike Suffordini, as well as Mike Lammers, who is the NASA Flight Director, who will be inside Mission Control during the activities, as well as Allison Bollinger, a spacewalk officer, who she and her team have choreographed the activities for Sonny and Aki. We'll get started with Mike. Well, good afternoon. As Josh said, we're here to talk to you today uh, at the outset of a, uh, an EVA. Um, we have been working on a number of, uh, of power problems over the last several weeks as uh, everyone's been following along. Uh, we had uh, a, the 3A solar array uh, set was not uh, in, the, um, in the mix for all of the power providing capability that the space station had because of a short that we experienced uh, several weeks ago. Uh, the team over the course of uh, a number of days uh, slowly reintegrated that system into uh, into the set and uh, it's back with us now. Uh, we we're actually don't know the root cause. We believe the root cause to be uh, perhaps the short of a, one of uh, 82 capacitors in the, uh, in the SSU. Uh, as a result of that short, it's, uh, we believe that we, uh, we basically burned out the capacitor. Uh, and, uh, and so now the short is gone. Uh, the system, the capacitors use for power, power quality purposes uh, and uh, missing one of 82 will not really affect the power quality. So we believe we're in a good uh, place with the three array and now we have uh, all eight channels providing power to the ISS. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is over the last uh, several weeks we have been watching, well, uh, the P6 array, since it's been on orbit, has had a very, very slow leak that we have been monitoring. As you may recall, about a year ago, uh, we recharged uh, one of the uh, systems out there uh, because of this leak. Uh, that's a normal capability that we have on ISS. Uh, the leak is, is amazingly slow. You couldn't see it if you were sitting on top of it. And so the, really the better part of Valor is just let the system uh, slowly leak down and recharge it as we've done. Uh, that process was to occur about once every four or five years, uh, and since we're outside for EVAs every so often anyway, that was the right position to be in. However, in about the June time frame, uh, we noticed that the leak rate picked up substantially, and, uh, and over the course of, um, and I say substantial, again, you're talking about a very slow leak uh, in terms of leaks in general, and so it takes, um, it takes several uh, weeks, if not months, to decide exactly what the leak rate is uh, in a system like this. That also, not only is it got a very, very slow leak, uh, we go through temperature changes regularly in these loops, and so it's very hard to, to get the actual uh, leak rate uh, without quite a bit of trend data. But anyway, over uh, two or three months, uh, we uh, determined that the leak rate was such that we'd get low enough that the system would shut itself down. Uh, probably in the late December, early January time frame. Uh, since that time, as we've continued to watch the leak, it looks like it, we could probably go another month or two. Uh, but, uh, but the data does indicate that we're going to leak down to a point where we will um, eventually have the system will shut down to protect itself. And so the decision has been made uh, to go ahead and uh, send uh, Sunny and Aki outside. Um, we don't know exactly where the leak is. Uh, it's, it's possible the leak is uh, in, the, uh, in the PVR itself, the radiator itself. It could be in the pump system or it could be in any one of the lines. And so uh, a leak rate this small, it's not like you can just take something out of the set while the crew's outside and then have them wait a couple minutes and you see where the leak is fixed or not and then you go work on the next thing. As I said before, it takes weeks, maybe months to see uh, if you've affected the leak rate. So the first thing we're going to do, and, and uh, uh, we'll talk about it more here uh, with the folks on the panel with me, but um, uh, the, the ob object here is to go uh, hook up to another array we have that's uh, out there on the P6 truss um, and was utilized as we called it the early system way back in the, in the day when we first started flying the space station. And, uh, and then see, uh, we can operate the loop this way, so we'll operate the channel this way and see if the leak stays with us or not. And then based on what that tells us, we'll 
decide if we have to do anything else outside. It's conceivable that if the leak is in the, in the uh, radiator itself, uh, we could just stay in this configuration and operate off the, um, off the radiator that uh, was originally intended for the ammonia, uh, early ammonia system. So that's what we're uh, going to go outside to, to tackle here in the next uh, few days, actually November 1st. Uh, between now and then, of course, we've just uh, got the, the next crew on board uh, with us. Uh, the next crew and, and fish are on board with us, and, and uh, everyone is doing well, including the, the fish. Um, uh, we have our next uh, major operation on board ISS is the return of the uh, Dragon capsule. Uh, that returns on Sunday, uh, with, I think we release it about 8.26 in the morning central time Sunday, and it lands or splashes down I think about 2.20ish in the afternoon that day, at least that's the current plan. So this all occurs on Sunday. Then uh, right before the EVA on the 31st, uh, 49 Progress will launch into a, a four orbit rendezvous with station. Uh, and so it'll launch and dock on the 31st, and then, uh, of course, the next day after that, we'll do the EVA. So we got a pretty busy period, um, but this is the right time to do this EVA. Uh, Sunny and Aki both have just been outside. The suits are all sized for them. They have experience, um, of course, very recent experience uh, outside. Sunny actually helped stow this, these partic this particular radiator that we're going to deploy and has quite a bit of experience with these QDs that we have to manipulate uh, outside. And so uh, for those reasons, uh, we think it makes sense to go ahead and let them go out uh, before they come home and uh, take care of this for us. So that's, that's, the, uh, that's the intent. So with that, I'll hand it off to Mike, who will get, go into more detail on the, uh, on the EVA. OK, thanks, Mike. Um, EVA 20 will be on uh, Thursday, November 1st, as Mike mentioned. Uh, the egress will be at uh, 7.15 a.m. Central Time, and the EVA is expected to last nominally about six and a half hours. Uh, just a review of our, our crew that's on board. Um, we have uh, Sonny Williams, um, Aki Hoshere, and uh, Yuri Malinchenko. And uh, they came up on Soyuz TMA-5M, which was launched on uh, December, uh, sorry, July 14th, Dr. Rosfet on July 17th, and the EVA will occur in their uh, 107th day on board of ISS. And of course, uh, we just uh, uh, acquired a new crew, uh, Kevin Ford, Oleg uh, Novitsky, and Evgeny Terelkin, and uh, they launched on Soyuz TMA-6M back on the 23rd. They docked to uh, Poisk uh, yesterday morning, and the EVA will occur on their seventh day in space. Uh, just to review the current config of the vehicle, um, actually the config of the EVA, uh, Progress uh, 48 will be on the Nader side at uh, the Piers docking module. Uh, Soyuz TMA-5M, as I mentioned, is at uh, Rosfet on the Nader side of the FGB. Uh, Soyuz TMA-6M is docked at Poisk, and uh, uh, Progress 49 uh, will arrive at the SM aft uh, about uh, 24 hours before the um, the EVA, and that's again a four orbit uh, launch and dock. Just kind of a, an overview of, of uh, the power system on board ISS, and Mike did a really excellent job of uh, kind of describing the uh, issues that uh, we're uh, working th with. The, the, um, we have eight power channels on board the ISS, and uh, it's basically one for each one of those uh, solar arrays that you see. And of course, uh, as we go through the eclipse period in the orbit, we, uh, we have a pretty good uh, complement of batteries and other equipment that gives us power when we're going through the Earth's shadow. Um, each one of those eight channels has its own um, cooling system, and it's actually separate from sort of the big cooling systems on board the vehicle that uh, we had to repair with an EVA a few years ago. I call it sort of the little brother. Um, there's eight of them. Each one consists of a, of a pump, um, also known as the uh, PFCS, the pump flow control um, system that's got a pump and some valves in it. Um, there's a radiator to uh, cool the ammonia, and you can see that uh, uh, going out towards the bottom of the screen there. And then a series of tubes and uh, cold plates to, uh, to pick up the heat. Um, each photovoltaic module, uh, P6, P4, S4, and uh, S6, um, each has two power channels, and as I described, two um, photovoltaic uh, thermal control systems. And uh, they're separate. There's eight of them, but kind of one of the uh, details is that radiator is shared between two systems. So what you see there with that one radiator, um, it's got the tubing for uh, 
all a P6 for both the two Bravo power channel, which we're uh, looking at uh, fixing here in uh, four Bravo. And so uh, the systems are separate, but they go through that same radiator. Um, again, we mentioned the two Bravos on P6. Um, that's way out there on the port side. And uh, that uh, was the first uh, uh, array um, that was launched a number of years ago. And if you remember, it actually used to live up on the zenith side of the vehicle. And, uh, and uh, we moved that from uh, the top of the Z1 truss in the zenith out to uh, the end of uh, P5, where it currently lives uh, as part of uh, STS-120 uh, back in October of 2007. Uh, so as Mike mentioned, uh, you know, we've had this very um, slow leak on the PVTCS since 2007. And, and again, I like to sort of characterize it as, as, a, as a leak that I had in my air conditioning system uh, a number of years ago, where it's it, about every two years, I got to put more Freon on the system, and it's not something that's immediately obvious. And uh, again, something if it's slow enough that we can go ahead and, and feed. And if you go ahead and uh, look at the next slide here, um, this is actually a really good comparison of uh, the two Bravo channel, which is the one with the leak and the four Bravo, um, which is in blue and has been uh, uh, tight. And uh, you can see that we normally run uh, just over 50 pounds of ammonia in the system. And you can see as we trend it out over s several years, we have a very um, uh, slow leak. And again, it's really, um, you need to look at it over weeks and months to sort of determine what the trend is. Um, you can see over there towards the right, uh, where we actually did the recharge on STS-134. And uh, that was uh, done on EVA-2 with uh, uh, Drew Foistel and Mike Fink. Uh, they put eight pounds into the system. Um, both uh, Drew and Mike have been really um, a great asset. They've been helping us a lot with this EVA. And uh, Mike will actually be the uh, Capcom during the EVA sitting to my right. Um, again, you can see on the right side of that that uh, we saw an increase in the rate and uh, you know, if you look at the conservative uh, sort of worst case, as Mike mentioned, it'd be in early uh, next year that uh, we'd hit the minimum. Uh, they tell me the minimum's about on that chart, calibrated to that chart is about 40 pounds. Um, and again, it's, it, the trick is it, it takes some time to, uh, to trend that line and figure out where it's going. <clears throat> uh, so kind of on a big picture of the EVA, and Allison will uh, has got some great graphics that she'll go through. But uh, again, we mentioned that the leak is most likely in um, either the, uh, the PFCS, the pump fold control system, or the radiator. Um, they're both ORUs. They both can be isolated from the systems. Um, we're real suspicious of the, um, the radiator just because of, you, you saw it, it kind of stretches out there and it's susceptible to micrometeoroid impacts. Um, and again, the goal of this EVA is to isolate the uh, PVR from the system by uh, closing an EVA actuated disconnect. Um, you know, by doing that and kind of watching the quantity that's in the radiator that's uh, cut off from the rest of the system, as well as the remainder of the system, we can uh, kind of determine if that leak is in the PVR or the, the uh, PFCS side. Um, as, uh, as Mike mentioned, we, we uh, have a spare radiator, and the way that we'll use that spare radiator is we'll, uh, we'll use these jumpers um, that were used to help fill uh, on 134, and we will uh, connect up um, that spare radiator to the two Bravo cooling system. And uh, those jumpers are actually um, dry now. There's no ammonia in them. Uh, we'll just get them into the right position, and we'll go ahead and uh, open them up, and that will just tie um, the current cooling system to that, uh, to that extra radiator that we have. Um, that spare radiator, again, was part of the old uh, EETCS, or the early external thermal control system that was used uh, primarily when, when that truss was up on the zenith side of the vehicle. Um, we uh, deactivated that in the winter of 2006 and 2007, and uh, during uh, EVA 7, uh, we put that radiator away. Um, that EVA was done uh, by Mike Lopez Alegria and uh, uh, conveniently enough, Sunny Williams, who will be doing this EVA. And it's been uh, real helpful to get her take and what she remembers. And it's, she remembers quite a bit about the work site and uh, her experience with putting that radiator uh, away. Um, and uh, we, we, uh, it's just real nice video. Of course, we'll be going in the reverse direction when we do the EVA itself, maybe. 
But um, again, if the leak was in the, in the PVR um, and we got that new radiator on the system, we can leave it there uh, long term. Um, even if we don't isolate the leak, that uh, old system has got quite a bit of additional ammonia in it. And of course, when the systems are tied together, they'll, uh, they'll uh, we'll essentially get a free recharge out of the system, which can also buy us uh, uh, quite a bit more runtime um, while we evaluate the next steps if uh, we continue to uh, monitor a slow, slow leak there. So uh, that's sort of the big picture of the current state of the power system and, uh, and our overall goals for the EVA. And of course, uh, Alan, Allison uh, Bollinger has been doing just an outstanding job with her team putting together a really, uh, a really uh, well put together EVA. And we've gotten uh, tremendous help from the engineering community uh, as well. And, and, and just, just everyone's been outstanding. So I'll give it off to uh, Allison. You can tell us all about it. All right. Thanks, Mike. So as Mike and Mike have both mentioned, our EVA is next Thursday, November 1st, with an egress time of approximately 7.15 a.m. The two crew members performing the EVA are once again ISS Commander Sonny Williams and Aki Hoshide. So if we can go to the first graphic, there we go. So Sonny Williams comes to us as our lead spacewalker, and she's also currently the top female spacewalker. She has just over 44 hours of EVA time that she has earned over six EVAs. And as Mike mentioned, two of those EVAs were actually spent out on the P6 truss, so she's very familiar with this work site. She will be wearing the suit with the red stripes, and this will be her seventh EVA. EV2 will be Aki Hoshide. He's the top JAXA spacewalker right now. He has a total of 14 hours and 45 minutes of EVA time that he earned in two EVAs just a, a little while ago that he performed with, with Sunny at the end of August and the beginning of September. He will be wearing the suit with the white stripes, and this will be his third EVA. The newly arrived flight engineer, Kevin Ford, will be our IV assistant. He will help the crew with their prep activities, which includes the in-suit light exercise or IL pre-breathe protocol that the two crew members will be using for this spacewalk. This is the same pre-breathe protocol that they used on both EVAs 18 and 19, so they are very familiar with it. Once the pre-breathe is complete, Kevin will assist in getting the crew members into the equipment lock. He'll shut up the hatch and then assist in the depress of that crew lock. And then once the depress is complete and the crew is ready to head outside, Kevin will hand the control over to Mike Fink, as, as other Mike mentioned, hand over to Mike Fink, who will be the ground IV, and then he will take the crew through their, their planned timeline activities. And then once the EVA is complete, Mike will hand back over to Kevin inside the vehicle, and Kevin will help get the crew inside the airlock, repress the airlock, and then assist in any ammonia decontamination procedure should the crew get contaminated during this procedure. So we can go ahead and talk through the, the overview uh, tasks of this EVA. So you could, as you know, big picture, as everyone mentioned, the idea here is to isolate the 2B loop that's currently flowing through the photovoltaic radiator, or PVR. So we go about doing that by driving the FQDC or the fluid quick disconnect coupling. So we'll demate that. And then uh, while that's going on, we'll also be taking some pictures of the currently deployed radiator as well as the integrated equipment assembly adjacent to it to see if we can see any other signs of a possible MMOD strike that could, be, that could account for this leak. We will then perform the early ammonia servicer or EAS jumper reconfiguration. And then the two crew members will work together to deploy that radiator, which is the trailing thermal control or ticker radiator, as you'll hear me, hear me describe it in just a little bit. There's a shroud currently covering that, so we'll stow the shroud and the two crew will work together to, uh, to deploy that radiator. We'll also have the crew remain at the work site to assist in a manual EVA deploy of that radiator if the, uh, if the ground commands are unsuccessful. So we can go ahead and start the first video. Okay, so the crew members will egress the ISS joint airlock. Aki will remain at the airlock while Sunny will start making her way port on the ISS truss. She will make a pit stop at the midpoint of P1 where she will establish the two crew members' safety tether anchor hooks. The crew will be using safety tether packs which consists of two 85-foot tethers ganged together. Once Aki's tether is secure, he'll translate aft to the Z1 starboard toolbox to retrieve a 12-inch socket extension that we'll need for the EVA's activities. Once Sunny has established her anchor point, she'll continue to head outboard along phase one to P3, and then she'll make her way aft and zenith around the Sarge. And then she'll translate along the zenith aft edge of P4 out to P5 and to the midpoint of P6, and she'll take the valley between the ticker and the sticker, which is the starboard radiator. Once she's out at the work site, she'll then make her way to the ISS forward face of P6. 
and there she will set up camp and she will start work initially on the EAS jumper reconfig. She'll continue working on that until Aki has retrieved the socket and followed the same translation path out to Sunny. Uh, once Aki's out there, he'll install the socket on the PGT or the pistol grip tool and the two crew members will work together to release the four fasteners that are currently holding the shroud that's flashing or the cover in place um, that's currently protecting the fluid quick disconnect coupling. Once the cover is out of the way, the uh, Sunny will get in place to drive that, that FQDC bolt. And that's about seven turns. And so here we can see a, a flight photo of the FQDC itself. So as, as Mike's have mentioned, there are actually two loops that are currently running through this radiator. The 2B side is on the left and the 4B side is on the right. So Sunny knows, drive the one on the left, don't touch the one on the right. So she's going to use a PGT with a 12-inch socket extension to drive that, and we do have some NBL footage of that task being accomplished. So once she gets in position, Aki will hand her the PGT and she'll get to work. As I mentioned, it's a 12-inch socket on this bolt, and we're only driving this bolt seven turns. And what that action is doing is it's physically separating the active and passive halves of this F FQDC, and it's closing the valves for both the supply and return ammonia flow path to this, the 2B side of this radiator. And this is the first time we have actuated one of these FQDCs on orbit. Once they're complete with the seven turns, they will work together to reinstall the shroud and cover and those uh, four fasteners that are holding it in place. And then Sunny will get to work completing the rest of the EAS jumper reconfiguration. So you've seen this graphic before. So the left side, left side shows what the current configuration is. The red FHO2 hose is the one that we actually used on the ULF-6 refill approximately a year and a half ago. Um, it, it had ammonia in it, and we've since vented it, and it's wire tied off on one end to the FHO1 hose. That FHO1 hose currently has a nitrogen pad, and the last time it has been touched was actually by Sonny Williams and Mike Lopez Alegria during those Expedition 14 EVAs when they installed this jumper in its current location. So we have some additional NBL footage showing this task. So here you can see part of the reconfig is already complete. So Sunny has reconfigured the jumpers in the lower part of the screen while she was waiting for Aki to arrive with a 12-inch socket. And then her next task is to demate the FHO1 jumper from the M9 male so she can vent that nitrogen pad from the jumper. Once she gets the jumper demated, she'll work on mating it to the nitrogen vent tool. Once the vent tool is mated, she opens the, the female quick disconnect on that jumper, and then she'll vent that nitrogen, and that vent should only take just a few seconds. Once she's complete with the vent, she'll demate the nitrogen tool from that jumper, stow it away, and then install that FHO1 jumper on the M10 male, and then she'll work to, uh, to reconfigure the FHO2 jumper onto the M9 male. So then we'll end up with the post-DVA configuration shown on the right, where the, FH, the red FHO2 jumper is what's supplying your chilled ammonia from the new radiator, or the old, newly deployed radiator, into the 2B PVTCS system, and then the blue jumper FHO1 is supplying your ammonia that's been warmed by the batteries and the other equipment out on the IEA back to your radiator for cooling. So once she's complete with the EAS jumper reconfig, she'll go over to help Aki so meanwhile, Aki has been taking the, the photos I mentioned of the radiator as well as the IEA, and he's also been working on stowing a shroud that's currently covering the ticker radiator. This shroud is a thin beta cloth material. It's permanently attached on the inboard or left side of this image, and then it's, it's attached by two hooks on the outboard side. It was installed by sliding along two guide straps that run on the top and the bottom of the radiator, so Aki will work to release one of the integrated hooks, and he'll slide it as far inboard as he can. Uh, he'll secure that, and then he'll translate to the other side of the radiator, or the top side of the radiator in this image, and he'll work to shimmy that down as far as he can until he reaches, an, reaches uh, some interference, and he'll, make his, he'll just continue going back and forth around the radiator until he gets the, the shroud all the way inboard. And once he gets it inboard, he will secure it with wire ties to hold it in place, and it, it's around this time that Sunny should be complete with her EAS jumper work, so she'll make her way to the aft side of P6 to help Aki with that shroud stow. And then the two crew members will work together to release the six cinches, which you can see flashing in this image, that are currently holding the radi radiator in its stowed config. They'll first release the inboard and outboard cinches and stow those in their stowage clips, and then they'll release the four side cinches and stow those. Once they're complete with the cinch release, they'll release the two final winch pit pins, which are holding the radiator in its stowed position. 
Once they release, release those winch pit pins, Aki will make his way inboard and Sunny will make her way to the outboard edge of the radiator. She'll verify that all tools, tethers, and EV crew members are clear of the radiator deployment envelope and then she'll give the ground the go to issue the command to deploy the radiator. She'll hang tight as the radiator is deploying, grab her camera and take a few pictures of that deployment. And like, as I mentioned, the manual drive bolt is located right there near her work site. So in the event that the uh, ground deploy isn't successful, she can help out with her pistol grip tool to manually deploy that radiator. As she's cleaning up her work site and taking a few more photographs, Aki is translating back to the airlock and along the same translation path that he took outboard. Once he's at the airlock, he'll establish a waist tether as the new safety, as the new safety tether for the pair. Sunny will start making her way inboard. She'll make a stop at the midpoint of P1 where she had anchored their safety tethers. She'll pick those tethers up, make her way back to the airlock as well, and then they'll close the hatch on a successful six and a half hour EVA. And the last image I'd like to leave you with is what I'm calling Sunny's deja vu. As Mike mentioned, this was, this, uh, Sunny you know, stowed this radiator during Expedition 14 and now she's going to be redeploying it. So hopefully she will enjoy uh, seeing this image once again with the exception of the Russian segment behind P6. Um, but with that, that's all I have and I'll hand it back to Josh. Okay, let's take some questions here in Houston first and we'll go to the phone lines. Let's start out with Gina. Um, I don't know who wanted to take, take this, but this is sort of like a detective trip going out there first to see if you can figure out, they can figure out where the leak is coming from and then you'll proceed from there? Yes, that's correct. What, what we'll do is, um, because we don't know exactly where the leak is, um, this, this affords us an opportunity to regain the loop um, while we check to see if we've, if we've um, taken care of the leak or not. And so uh, what this will tell us is whether the radiator is the cause of the leak. Um, if, if it turns out the leak continues, uh, well, we, we have a little time because the, the loop will continue to operate, but as Mike said, um, when we filled this system a year ago, uh, the result of that fill was also fill up the early ammonia system as well, and so we have extra ammonia in that loop. So it buys us a little time, it helps us isolate the PVR, lets us isolate the PVR to see if that's the cause. If that turns out not to be the cause, then we have to <clears throat> think about the next steps. And, and there was one, one point we contemplating going outside, you can isolate all of those, you could isolate the pump, the PVR, and the lines. You have to keep the system shut down. But again, it takes you several weeks to figure out where, what's leaking and, and if it's leaking. So the next step after this, if we're still leaking, like I said, bought, we've bought ourselves some time, we'll go think about uh, what we want to do next, whether we want to try to isolate the other two systems and just have the system shut down for a while, whether we want to just go and proactively R&R the pump and see if that fixes the problem. So we, we have some forward work to do after this. Um, as Mike said, and, and uh, many of us believe, um, if you look at pictures of the ISS, you'll find, uh, you'll find MMOD hits on, on two or three of them at two or three locations. Uh, so it's entirely possible that the leak source is a, is a hit to this particular PVR. So this gives us at least that. It'll tell us if that's the cause or not, and then we can decide later if, uh, if it's not that, what we do next. If it is a micrometeorite hit, I mean, some of those are so small, you really can't do much to anticipate those. What do you do to defend yourself against something that's that tiny a hit? Or how tiny a hit would it have to be to cause a leak? Well, this leak's really small. Like, the actual point at where you're leaking is probably around the width of your hair, perhaps even smaller than that. So it's a very, very tiny uh, leak. We may not even see it. If it's a if it's a if it's a direct hit and that's as small as the hole is, you we won't see it. If it's a glancing blow, and we're at the deepest point you manage to to uh, you know cut into the line, then maybe you'll see it because you have the the glancing blow. And the design of ISS was was built to withstand these kinds of hits, and in these systems, it was the redundancy of the systems that gave us that capability. And so. Uh, if it turns out to be an MMOD hit, this is exactly the way the design was, was meant to deal with it. And we, we could live without this power system for the time it would take us to go outside and, and change out a pump or a, or a, or a radiator or whatever. So that, that's that. You know, the rest of the, the pressurized modules have uh, shielding around them for the smaller uh, MMOD. And, uh, and then for the larger, of course, we, we protect ourselves uh, with the help of the uh, the STRATCOM folks who let us know when we have a potential conjunction. Thank you. Robert. 
Uh, Robert Perlman with Collect Space. Um, again, for who wants to take it, if you if you by chance do see the MMOD strike, if Sunny gets out there and the sun's at the right angle and you happen to see it, does that change anything with the spacewalk in terms of activities that you would do? Um, and is if it is an MMOD hit, would you consider bringing the radiator back on a future SpaceX Dragon to study, or and do you have an extra radiator out there to replace it? Let's see. A, we have an extra radiator, so one we're using. Um, the, we have two spare PBRs. They're the one the one we're deploying to use, and the other one uh, that Allison referred to as the sticker. Uh, so those are our spare PBR radiators. We have one spare central system radiator also that sits on one of the uh, external pallets outside. Uh, if we saw what we thought was the hole, it wouldn't stop what we'd do it because we're going into a configuration that we can operate from indefinitely. And so uh, we'd go, wow, that's interesting and, and uh, gee whiz, and we would assume that this is going to solve our leak problem. We would config continue with the configuration. And as I said, we could stay like this indefinitely. So we would that's probably what we'd do. And then we'd have the conversation about do we want to go to all the trouble to move a radiator because that's not a simple process. And I don't have a capability to return a radiator today. so. Mark. Thanks, uh, Mark Rowe for Aviation Week. I had a couple of questions. Uh, does anybody know the di dimension of the uh, radiator you'll be deploying? Uh, I don't know it exactly. We can get you that number. How long does it take to deploy? With Seven PGT? minutes. Oh, with the PGT? Yeah. I remember it took, it's about one second a foot at the PGT. Mm -hmm. So I, just guessing, I would say it's probably 30 or 40 feet. I think it's 45 yeah. feet long, about 17 feet or 15 feet wide. I'm not sure what the other dimension is. And um, I just wanted to follow up on the on the spare question um, and make sure I understood. Sorry, uh, you do have a an undeployed spare radiator. Is that the case that was taken up during the last? Uh, series of shuttle missions to give you spares? That's the central system radiator. They're much bigger than the than these uh, PBRs. So they're different radiators. So we have one of those. That's the one you're thinking of. We flew it up on the second to the last flight, I think, on a pallet. Anyway, one of the last flights that took the pallets up. We, no, I think it was the last flight, in fact, we took the pallet up, had it on there. Um, and then for the PBR system, the spares, the intended spares, were the two early ammonia system radiators, that, one of which we're going to deploy. If you if you re, if, if you replace this and you still see the lead trend, um, uh, do you do you have some time, um, or are you kind of back in a contingency EVA mode where you have to go out and do something uh, before the end of December, early January? Um, I, I guess I'm just trying to sort of figure out where you go if. After you replace this, it sounds like it may take a few weeks to determine whether you have a leak or not. And then, if you do, you're sort of bumping up against the uh, the deadline you spoke of sooner. So that's just my question. Right. And as we talked about, so there's more ammonia now that's been brought to bear, so we can go a little longer at the leak rate. Um, it's not completely clear to us the actual leak rate, so it may be. Uh, a little bit slower. So we've probably bought ourselves, just because we have the extra ammonia, we probably bought ourselves a few months to, to work and they think told about me it. October based on there the you go. Rate. Trending. And of course, there's a lot of assumptions that go into that, but, but using the number that had them lasting until December or January, I think they told me October. Um, and again, lots of assumptions go into that number, but it is better, and I think that's the message. Okay. Is that it from here? Let's go to the phone lines. We'll come back here. Uh, let's see. We have Bill Hardwood with CBS News. Yeah, a couple of real quick ones from me. Um, I think you just answered um, that my first question is, which is how long you could last. And Mike, I guess you're saying if nothing changed and it all stayed the same, you've got till next fall to figure something out. Which, uh, by the way, you'll have to. Spe well, there's a lot of mics involved with this EVA, <laughs> so maybe you should call me Mike, and we'll we'll <laughs> defer to Mr. Sefardini here, but. I'll be so yeah, sorry about like, that. Sorry about that. But uh, um, if, if we, if I, I think your question was, if we did nothing, how long could we last? Um, once, you've reconfigured. Uh, once, once we've reconfigured, how long we could last? Um, 
it's, it's longer, it depends on the assumptions that you use, and uh, we think it's until October. Okay, thanks. Um, and another quick one for me, how does an MMOD hit explain the change in the leak rate? Since you had a small leak rate at first and there was a, a change of some sort, uh, would that not imply two leaks? That's what that would imply, correct. So we have the existing leak that we've been feeding. Um, don't know exactly where it is. Might be at a QD connection. Don't know. But anyway, we've been feeding it. Um, most of us don't believe that that leak has gotten worse. Um, so that was in the fault tree, though, is the possibility that whatever was causing that leak has, has now grown for reasons that we couldn't exactly explain. Um, and so that is certainly one of the possible causes. Um, and uh, but most of us kind of leaning towards the MMOD impact just because it's uh, a more likely scenario. Okay, and finally for me, um, following up on Mark Caro's question, the early ammonia coolant system two radiators you mentioned that are out on P6, can they be moved if if a PVR on some other you know module got damaged down the road? Yes. Thank you. Okay, Jim Oberg with NBC. Yeah, hi, this is for. For Mr. Suffredini, hello. Uh, and I've got all the technical questions answered on the EVA, so thank you. Uh, is it my impression that this uh, last launch, uh, last week, was the first from the first the U.S. launch from the new pad or the old pad, rather? And if it was, uh, what did it look like? How different was it than watching it from uh, the Gagarin pad? Well, Jim, I have to tell you, I wasn't at this particular launch. Uh, I divide that responsibility with my boss, who was nice enough to go this time, so I wasn't there to witness it. Um, it was the first human launch from that pad, is my understanding, at least for many, many years, if it, if it hasn't been forever. Um, and uh, it, my understanding in talking to, to my colleagues is that you're much further away than you are when you're at pad one. Uh, so it was a, a, a different view. It's also a much longer trip to get out to the pad. Um, but you'd have to ask, uh, next time you get Gerst in front of a camera, you might ask him what he thought of the, of the view. Off no, no problem. Yeah, it was a couple about 40 years ago in the early 70s, or there were a couple of Soyuz man launches. But you're right, it's been about 40 years. Okay, well, take that real good, and uh, maybe you know, we'll both go to watch the next one. I'd be glad to do that with you. Okay. Okay. Uh, let's go to MichaelAllSpace.com. Oh yeah, hi guys. Thanks for for doing this. This is just just sort of a basic question. Could you put into just like a little perspective, I mean, is this a more challenging spacewalk than the average space? I mean, I know there's, there's no such thing as an average one, but could you just, just kind of tell us, I mean, is this one yeah, going to be part, yeah, no, really challenging, really technically yeah, and difficult in like some ways that you haven't experienced before? I mean, just like a little perspective on what's, what to expect with this one. Um, I'll I'll let Allison handle some of the technical stuff, but it's it's different. Um, some of the, these recent spacewalks that we've been doing, of course, are outside of the shuttle era, and um, it, it's been different just from a big picture perspective. In that, uh, you know, this crew didn't know that they were doing that particular spacewalk when when they launched, and in fact, uh, didn't know until about three weeks ago. So, it's it's interesting um, from from the point of view of of getting of getting the. Sonny and Aki ready on orbit and getting them briefing packages and talking through things and, and getting them trained when they're when we don't have the opportunity that we had with the shuttle crews where we'd uh, we'd all go out to the MBL we'd we'd work through the procedures and uh, and then you know sit around in the table and uh, talk about how things went we have to uh, we have to take a little bit different approach uh, when it comes to just just getting ready overall and getting these guys uh, ready to go out the door. So that's it from the big picture perspective, and maybe uh, Allison's got a few things on the on the technical end. Yeah, I would say this is an average skill level EVA, uh, maybe slightly more challenging than your average EVA. The thing that we have going for us is that Sunny is very experienced with fluid quick disconnects. That would be the the one task in my mind that's more complicated is we do have quite a bit of fluid quick disconnect manipulation during this EVA. But since Sunny has seen these exact jumpers and QDs during increment 14, and she also experienced quite a bit of QD action uh, during her Z1 work during these same EVAs, I feel like she has a leg up on the competition because she's she's done all this stuff before. The other thing that's a little more challenging is, as I mentioned, this is the first time that we've operated one of those fluid quick disconnect couplings, or the FQDC. So that mechanism does look sort of intimidating, but we've got an agreement that we only need to turn it just, just enough turns to close the valves. 
So that, uh, that shouldn't, be, shouldn't be that bad. And the, the rest of the tasks, the radiator deploy, we've done those uh, quite a few times over the years. So we have a good experience base to pull from. So I, I feel like that task shouldn't be too challenging either. Thank you. OK, thanks, Mike. Uh, let's see, do we have an Edward with JIJ Press? Yeah, I uh, don't really have a question at this time, though. Everything's been answered, so thank you. Thank you very much. Let's come back here to Houston and see if there's any follow-ups. Mark. Oh, Mark Rowe for Aviation Week. Uh, I have a Dragon question, if that's OK. Uh, could you, as best you know now, um, are you still looking at December for the next flight? And um, will the, the first stage propulsion issue, as best you know now, have any uh, any bearing on the scheduling, or do you have some flexibility in flying that flight if it is in terms of delivering needed supplies or bringing things back? Well, let's see. That flight, you're talking about SpaceX 2. The SpaceX 2 flight is currently in January. Um, they were supposed to move the first stage. Uh, it's kind of all coming together, but I thought it was early last week. Uh, we have agreed together to leave the stage in McGregor for a little while while the team tries to get to root cause of the anomaly. Um, and uh, my understanding is we probably have about another week or so before we start pushing uh, the launch date. Uh, so that's kind of rough. I'm trying to remember in my head those exact dates and they're not coming to me. Uh, so we have a little bit of flexibility be start before we start affecting the launch date. The launch date itself in January is not really critical. Uh, to the program from a supply standpoint. Um, so we have some flexibility. My understanding, however, is that pushing that flight um, pushes SpaceX, uh, the next SpaceX flight to ISS, SpaceX uh, 3, because they're going to the new version of the Falcon 9 uh, launch vehicle. And they have to modify the pad and do some things to get ready, and they have some other flights before ours on the new Falcon. So. Um, so any movement of that vehicle to the right, although not an impact to us from a logistics standpoint for that flight, uh, does impact um, the next flight to ISS, at least today, that's on paper, it looks that way. I'm sure there's some things they can do to make, make up a little bit of that. So there is a possibility that this, that uh, resolving this anomaly will move the, the uh, Falcon, to the uh, SpaceX 2 flight a little bit. Um, uh, and it can move from our perspective, from a logistics perspective, we're in really good shape on orbit. So we could move um, quite a bit to the right and not really be impacted by it. So we've got plenty of time to sort out the, the root cause. The team's doing an excellent job. Uh, we've got a lot of folks involved um, with, our, with our SpaceX friends uh, to try to get to root cause. Uh, they're reporting back to us weekly as we, as we try to sort through it. Um, and as soon as we have something we can hang our hat on, we'll go look at the stage we got at McGregor and see if it is susceptible to that, that failure mode, and then we'll know more about the impact of the next flight. Yeah. And I just wanted to follow up uh, one more on, on the Dragon, uh, the current Dragon uh, mission. Um, I think it was sort of noted that, that the payload was light, that's my term, I'm not accusing anyone of saying that, but will, do you anticipate, I mean, is, was that sort of part of the plan that you could be that flexible or would you anticipate that that the missions would carry uh, more payload up in the future or I, I just, I guess I'm yeah. not quite sure but, how you. Yeah, I'll be glad to address that. Um, we have bought uh, a certain amount of up mass, 20 metric tons, over 12 flights and we will uh, get 20 metric tons over 12 flights. Um, we loaded up the International Space Station with the last few shuttle launches in order to have flexibility and launch uh, in logistics needs. Uh, so as these flights move to the right, uh, we would be able to accommodate it. Um, our, so we work with our, all of our, our partners, and SpaceX is one of them. And, um, our SpaceX uh, folks were able to carry more capacity on, on that vehicle uh, had we needed it, but we didn't have a need for more up mass. So uh, they came and said, if you don't need the up mass, we have another customer that we'd like to carry up, uh, which we agreed to. That was the Orbcom uh, folks. Flying Orbcom meant you also flew some ballast. So, so when you talk about the mass of the Orbcom and the total capability of the, so of the uh, SpaceX 
vehicle, you, you can't say, wow, what, what happened to the missing up mass? It, there was a ballasting uh, issue associated with that that they also took care of. But they flew up the up mass that we needed them to. Uh, that is all that counts towards the up mass that we procured. Um, and in compensation for that, uh, they put some more capability on future spacecraft uh, because we were flexible with them. Uh, and, and what they gave us uh, in, com in return, uh, while still maintaining the total up mass that they're due over the 12 flights, was the cap capability to bring home even more can powered uh, stowage coming down, which is a critical need for us to keep our life sciences uh, logistics flow uh, return up and down um, taken care of. So it was a very big uh, compensation for, for the agency in that respect, and it also was a big help for SpaceX because they were able to take care of their other customer. So it was mutually agreed to. We still have all the same up mass we had planned to. We didn't need this up mass, and we got extra capability out of the vehicle, so it was a, uh, an agreed to change. Okay. Just one quick follow-up on uh, on the radiator. Just remembering deploy and of um, of long packed uh, solar arrays. Is there any stickage issues? Um, and is there any concern if there are stickage issues? Do you have tools set up to try to free that? Sure. Okay. Uh, or I'll do it too. Well, you know, the one thing is it's not it's not a solar array. So the mechanism is you know we were very careful about solar arrays and and uh, you know solar arrays are considerably more flexible on the um, on the uh, the mechanism. It's a scissors mechanism and it's it's um, it it doesn't really stick. We've never had issues with deployments or or uh, retractions and we've we've done them a bunch of times on uh, on these radiators. Okay, Gina, anything? Okay. Just going to wrap it up for us. We want to remind you that our coverage on November 1st will begin at 6.15 a.m. Central Time. That's going to be 7.15 a.m. Eastern Time. The spacewalk itself, as you heard, will begin about an hour later at 7.15 a.m. Central Time, 8.15 a.m. Eastern Time. And, of course, we'll have live coverage of the entire thing. Another programming reminder, coming up this Sunday, we will have live coverage of the farewell and departure of the Dragon spacecraft from the International Space Station. Our coverage will begin at 6 a.m. Central Time. The actual release will take place uh, almost two and a half hours later at 8.26 a.m. Central. Uh, we will wrap up our coverage soon after Dragon actually departs the vicinity of the orbiting complex. Uh, but the deorbit burn for Dragon will take place at 1.28 p.m. Central with a splashdown about 250 miles off the coast of California around 2.20 p.m. Central Time. We will not have that live on NASA television, but you can follow the latest in terms of the deorbit burn and the confirmation of the splashdown on both SpaceX's website and the NASA website, which you can access at www.nasa.gov/station. We want to thank you for joining us. We'll see you back here Sunday for coverage of Dragon.